at least uh, for Korea, there may be particular countries within Asia where a currency union would make sense, but applying a basic theory of optimum currency area that says there are costs and benefits of any exchange rate regime, and they're going to vary systematically according to factors like how open the economy is, what patterns of shocks are, and so forth. That looking at that uh, carefully, we think that uh, it makes no sense for Korea to be spending a uh, substantial amount of time thinking about uh, issues of joint currency in Asia. We think that's sort of a red herring. On the other hand, we think trying to promote greater Asian monetary co and financial cooperation is extremely important. Uh, in fact, my concern would be with the talk of the common currency, that that deflects uh, attention to the more substantive uh, things. One, one of the sad things to me in, in so many of the discussions of greater uh, monetary cooperation in Asia is you, you will get all kinds of discussions of coordinating exchange rate policy. You almost never see discussions of coordinating monetary policy. But if you're not prepared to coordinate monetary policy, there's very limited scope for coordinating exchange rate policy. You know, there is some scope. Sterilized intervention, I think, can have, can have some of that. But uh, I try every time I hear somebody talking about exchange rate cooperation, to ask them, uh, well, you also favor monetary coordination. And very often I get a sort of comparative silence or people aren't quite ready uh, to do that. I, th I think there are important interdependencies in cases for that uh, in growing financial interdependence. And I would like to see much more focus uh, on that. And, and that would, love to see more building up of a strong secretariat of some type of international financial uh, organization um, within Asia to get much more of the highest broker type uh, and ADD has been picking up and doing a lot of this but it, it's not it's sort of by default almost it, it's not the natural organization to do it the ASEAN the Secretary is not that strong. There are various discussions going on about would love to see that move much stronger. That's not as glamorous as doing things, but I think that would be much more substantive. Inflation targeting has come into a lot of flat recently. Uh, much of it, I think, misguided. Uh, I don't read any of the recent development that's saying that inflation targeting isn't a basic right strategy as long as you interpret it flexibly, which I've always felt that one needed to do. To me, the big lesson is uh, it's not a sufficient strategy. That uh, one of the things that I first became aware of in looking at the Asian crisis in 97, 98, was that you could have asset bubbles with low inflation. Uh, we've now had that in the industrial countries as well. So that there's not, and typically uh, the bubbles I've known about in the past were coupled with way loose monetary policy. Uh, probably uh, one, one can make an argument that in the U. U.S. the bubbles were encouraged by fairly loose monetary policy, but there certainly that wasn't the only factor going on. There can be a disconnect uh, between what's going on in the asset markets and what's going on in the money markets, uh, much more than I would have thought 20 years ago. Uh, I think it's still very controversial as to how much monetary policy should be adjusted with asset uh, my own view is still that monetary policy ought to focus more on goods and services policy. But we know from the theory of economic policy that generally you can't get 
uh, two targets with one instrument. And so I think we need financial regulation to be more of the focus for dealing with asset bubbles and things like that. This is not to say that looking at asset uh, bubbles uh, shouldn't give any input into uh, monetary policy. But I think the, uh, the argument that monetary policy should focus primarily on inflation, except when you have major shocks, right? You know, something like we're going, going through now. It is because the whole purpose of the inflation targeting, uh, as I see it, is not to slavishly get a particular inflation target, but to overcome the time and consistency problem so you don't. Because to short run maximize, keep ratcheting up inflation over time. So I have always thought the case for it was a sort of a loose don't get carried away with escalating inflation as, as the way to, uh, to look at it. Um, I think one, uh, one of the things I mentioned to talk about in the discussion is what, what are the various lessons from the crisis that uh, different people are drawing very different uh, conclusions and that makes a big difference to what kind of policy recommendations uh, you're going to make. I think one clear lesson uh, is that it should teach the advanced, the current crisis, should teach the advanced economies to have a little more humility in lecturing emerging markets about what kind of policies they should, they should have. I, mean, I think we should have had more humility to, uh, to start with, but I think this clearly says we've got to be a little more careful about uh, about preaching that we do. And I think in general we're seeing that uh, we have to have more neat, nuanced stories. And, uh, uh, the devil is in the details. And we're seeing that in many, many dimensions now. Uh, I view the current crisis as having been caused not exclusively but very heavily by what I call deficient mental models. People having the wrong view of the world. And so one one of my uh, sticks that uh, I do is try to get economists to focus more on the implications of different models. Uh, This is catching on a lot recently, but it was sort of Ironic, particularly in a lot of the early rational expectations were, it assumed everybody knew the truth. So on one hand, we assume everybody knows the true model and draw the implications. Then we go out and debate among ourselves about monetarism, new classical Keynesian, and it makes a, a tremendous difference. Uh, I don't think we can assume people always have the true model. Uh, I don't think even we can assume that we always know that the true model. Is uh, in some recent papers, uh, I, I've tried to tra- trace this out in more detail. The the, uh, the simplest efficient mental model is the easy one: the widespread belief that housing prices will just keep going up forever. Okay. Not very many sophisticated economists believe that, but lots of other people did uh, de facto. And if you look at all at so many of the policies that look so crazy, like ninja loans and things like that, um, they actually made sense if housing prices were going to continue to rise. Because that's how the equity would, you didn't need a down payment, uh, the continued appreciation would get you the down payment over time. Uh, but these things that made sense if you could guarantee prices were going to keep rising, Turned out to be an absolute disaster when prices stopped rising. There wasn't enough uh, attention. So there was a herd instinct. Uh, and it is. Now, I hate saying this. I was trained as very much a Chicago type economist at the University of Virginia. So it was very painful over the years for me to uh, come to see that empirically some of my favorite models didn't always work. But I'm a pragmatist enough to. Uh, See, I've, I've got to pay some attention to the data, even if I don't like 
uh, like what he's telling. So um, I do think financial markets are fairly efficient in the sense that it's not easy to make money beating them. But 